Welcome, dear viewers, to our format today, Natural Medicine. Today I am talking to a wonderful doctor about the topic of fatigue, lethargy, and how such phenomena sneak into our everyday life, what causes this can have and how we can get back to activity and dynamics in life as quickly as possible. We will discuss that today. Stay tuned. Hello, dear Alexandra. Hello, Karina. Nice to have you back. We have already had a few interviews with each other. You have a clinic together with Professor Dr. Rao, right? Yes, the Sonnenberg Clinic. It really takes care of people holistically. On the topic of fatigue, perhaps chronic fatigue, what is the key point for you where you say, hey, this is an important topic and we should really talk about it now? That it happens more and more often. Yes, that is something that used to be much less common. There was once a case, for example, when I went to school, exactly the opposite, when I went to school in the first grade, we had a child where they used to say Zappel Philip, where today there are often several children, or even a lot of them. And it is similar with fatigue. We experience more and more that patients suffer from fatigue. Sometimes they also report this symptom. But quite often it is simply a part of other things, because in the questionnaire that you fill out with us, it is indicated fatigue, concentration disorders. And if you look at it a little more closely, then there are also differences between fatigue and drowsiness. For a while, in 2007, I started working in psychiatry. It was all summarized as some kind of depression. Psychiatrically, the topic of depression has also become much more complex. Then at some point the diagnosis was established as CSF, chronic fatigue syndrome, as a more or less recognized diagnosis. But that also simply shows that it is increasing. Now we have several factors. So now I get a few things in my head, of course, such as environmental stress. But if I remember my childhood, when I was visiting my grandparents, there was always a nap. Yes, exactly. That's right. Physiologically, we have two low points a day. If the cortisol level works normally, then I have a high phase at 8 o'clock. I have a low point at 12 o'clock. I try to show that a bit. I start in the morning, then go up a little after lunch, but not to the starting point. In the afternoon, around 4 o'clock, I also have a low point. Then it goes up a little more, and then it finally goes down. And then I can sleep around 22 o'clock, if the hormones work normally. So it's okay. Even if older people go to bed at noon, even if younger people go to bed at noon, which may only take 10 to 20 minutes, then I have also reached a sleep that should not disturb my night's sleep. In general, however, it is the case that we often no longer treat lunchtime as a time of rest. Or on hot days, like we had a lot of them now, we don't make a siesta, but just have a coffee and then continue to work. A lot of people do that. And of course these are not species-appropriate living conditions. Often we don't have a choice. Sometimes we can change a little. Even a lunch break, if you have the opportunity, from the point of view of work, maybe make it half an hour longer, rather go half an hour later. Also there is a rat tail hanging on the back. If you have children, it's problematic again. So either you push yourself, or you take a nap. I think these are things that you might think are obvious, that this is causative. And that certainly plays a role. But the actual causes I think are even deeper. So why don't the hormones work anymore? Why doesn't the cortisol process work anymore? 
We certainly come to the area of the adrenal weakness, but we also come to the area of neurotoxicosis, i.e. toxins, toxins that go to the nervous system, that also go to the brain. Someone who is chronically tired often has brain fog, feels a little dazed in the brain, or often has word-finding disorders, says a different word than he actually wanted to say. Or how was the name now? How was the phone number? You don't say that anymore today. Such things often go hand in hand. Or a disturbed night's sleep, a night's sleep rhythm. I don't have that many patients who can fall asleep badly. But sleeping through, I think even statistically, is no longer possible for 60 to 80 percent of people. Or that people don't have enough deep sleep phases. I also have those extremes who measure it themselves and then say, I don't have any deep sleep, I don't regenerate myself, and I feel like I'm awake all night, I don't regenerate myself. The body can last for a while, in the worst case, even years and many years. I don't want to say that you go through with it, but you don't die from it as quickly as some people think. The brain works in a very interesting way. When we sit upright, the brain knows, oh, we're awake, and when we lie down, the brain works differently. That's also when I want to meditate. I can meditate differently while sitting than when I'm lying down. All my concentration, my thoughts, my possibility to relax, depends on which position my head is in. If it's in a lying position, the whole body is lying flat, then the body is able to regenerate. I can't take all the effects that a good deep sleep would bring with it, but it does bring something. And that keeps us alive for years. It is desirable that it is better, but it shouldn't cause panic, because then it often gets even harder to sleep deeply and well. Yes, for many people it is a challenge. Where do I start now? Exactly. A lot of patients come up to me, and they say, make sure I sleep, and then everything will be fine again. Yes, it's not that easy. We do have a certain repertoire of biological remedies to promote sleep, but you have to say, depending on the severity of sleep disorders or fatigue, they don't work as well as a classic sleeping pill, for which I'm not advertising now, please. But it's actually the other way around. If I approach the body at other points, if I clean up the body, if I take care of the liver, if I regulate or remove stress hormones, then sleep doesn't necessarily come back as the first symptom. But if I start to treat causes and regulate them from a deeper point of view, then the body works along. For example, this morning I looked at blood values from a patient who felt that it wasn't going very well, and then I could give her some feedback. She asked me via email, and I said, okay, you know what, I see a lot of changes in your lab, in the direction of, we have filled up deficits, there are values that have recovered a lot, and I see typical changes as I see them with an active detoxification. But the body always cleans up in its order. If I have learned something in recent years, the body cleans up in its order and not necessarily in the order we would like. And now you just have to weigh how important it is that sleep gets better, how deep do I dig in there. And the other thing is, I also worked briefly in a sleep lab. We also do 24-hour HFV, so heart rate variability measurements, where we can also see whether there are deep sleep phases or not. Or there are other possibilities, small devices, to track yourself. And sometimes, it also depends on the disease, but now people also have the feeling, I don't sleep, I don't sleep. You can definitely tell, they do sleep. But there is really something decoupled somewhere in the brain. 
What I found so exciting was this topic of hormones, water intake. I also had this theme, where I also had the root treatment tooth. But then I'm really on this Rosenwurz and 5-HTP, progesterone. Can you say something about those things? Because I really had the feeling that they really moved something. Rose root, rhodiola, is an adaptogen, a really great plant. Adaptogen always means, it increases the adaptability of the nervous system. Also two more from the rubric, which I really like, are ashwagandha and astragalus. Ashwagandha has all three different effect spectra and focus points. The 5-HTP is 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is a precursor of serotonin and therefore a precursor of melatonin. That means I can raise my mood and promote sleep at night. With people, let's say, where the damage is not too advanced, I can sometimes very quickly or someone who is more or less healthy, may be in a stressful phase, doesn't sleep well therefore, he takes 5-HTP, that can work very quickly without much further measures being necessary. But it depends a bit on the actual cause. I always ask, how is it to fall asleep? How is it to sleep through? How is the inner restlessness? There are people who are extremely exhausted and at the same time extremely restless internally, still have circles of thought, even if they are confused and sometimes tend to break off. I also sometimes ask how childhood was. How were they in school? Were they dreamers? Or did the teacher say to the parents that the child was underprivileged? Did you get through school without learning? That always gives me clues about how brain metabolism is or how it is arranged. Often I don't work with 5-HTP, but I take a step before and intervene regularly in the brain metabolism, but I don't, I'll call it regulating, not manipulating. With 5-HTP, I'm almost pushing in one direction. I'm already making it very clear. I can take another step before and, for example, work with Sam. Please don't just imitate Sam. You also need to have some background information on when to use it and what side effects it can have. It just needs certain cofactors. For example, if I need B vitamins, I need zinc, I need vitamin C, I need magnesium. That's an important basis, that there are no deficits to have balanced neurotransmitter levels. Then there are two sides, whether it's SAM, which is a little more calming. Is that an amino acid? Yes, SAM means adenosylmethionine. It's an ATP molecule coupled to methionine, which is an amino acid. ATP is our energy molecule. SAM has many advantages, but again please don't just use it. It detoxifies the liver. If you take it regularly, it's a light painkiller. It's like an antidepressant, but it's also an antidote to dopamine. That's what I meant by the two sides. That's why you need to know how to use it. It also increases serotonin and melatonin levels. It's actually a great thing, but you need to know a few details about the cofactors and the dosage. Otherwise, it can have unintended effects. You can't use it on Parkinson's disease and on existing antidepressants. I have to say, I'm a specialist in psychiatry. I have experience with antidepressants. For example, someone with venlafaxine has taken 225 grams beforehand and is now at 150 milligrams. It still has enough effect, but it would have liked a little more. I've seen that it didn't have any side effects with 225 milligrams. You can overdose it. Then I would give some SAM sometimes 5-HTP with a small dose. 
There I have to say, I'm a specialist in psychiatry. I have experience with it, not just for doing it yourself. Otherwise, it can cause problems with serotonin metabolism. Exactly. Serotonin can be overdone, and it can have adverse side effects. So please don't just take it. But the sadder it is, maybe someone is watching and is not feeling well and has gone to the doctor and he says antidepressants. You can get it quickly. It's not a challenge anymore. Wouldn't it be advisable to try roseroot and 5-HTP? Yes, definitely. Rosenwurz is also a remedy that accesses the mitochondria and can improve our energy. It's not a pure antidepressant, but it also has a very good effect. 5-HTP is also, but every depression is the same and not necessarily a serotonin deficiency. Let's get back to dopamine. It can also be a dopamine deficiency. Then I am wrong with Sam and 5-HTP doesn't do much. I had a patient report and it was similar. He got serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs, serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. I already knew that the drugs he got didn't work. No, it was like this. He once had an antidepressant that worked on another leg that you don't use as first choice. He tried 5-HTP and it didn't work. I think that was completely clear to me as a psychiatrist, that it didn't work. I have to go a different route there. And what is more common with men is dopamine deficiency and no lack of serotonin. That is, men are more irritable, or they are looking for a kick. When driving a car, when riding a motorcycle, even when having sex, an increased sexual drive can sometimes be a neurotransmitter imbalance. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with testosterone. And then as a therapist, I don't put them on the SAM or 5 ATP. Then I have to treat differently. Even if it's the adrenal gland, if I'm sure it's the adrenals, the fatigue, then I have to weigh whether the SAM or 5-ATP is the right one. 5-ATP could be a good bridge, but then I would treat differently again. How could I find out if it's the adrenals? Sorry if I ask briefly, but if people really had private challenges and stress situations, then it can happen that the adrenals signals that a few months later. Yes, it takes a while for that to be noticeable. There is already something going on in the body. And the adrenals are already on the symptom level. If I attack causally, I'm actually still at earlier points. That means, how is the liver? How is the state of intoxication? What we haven't mentioned yet. What about viruses? A fatigue syndrome can also occur after a classic influenza or a fever. Epstein-Barr virus is a virus that belongs to the large group of herpes viruses. If you have a blister here and it's gone again, the virus is not dead or out of my body. And so it is with other viruses too. If I have stress, they are happy. If I have a lack of minerals, if I have too many toxins, if I have a vitamin deficiency, then the viruses can party. This can also be expressed in fatigue and brain fog. If a patient comes to you and says, I'm just tired, I don't know if I have depression or whatever. What are the most important factors for you, if we have viewers, to really look at? That you also have something in your hand where you can say, I want to have checked this and that value now. To see for myself in which direction it is actually going. I'm not really a biologist who does labs for thousands of euros or francs. 
There are patients who have such symptoms. I usually find it in relatively simple laboratory values. I didn't learn in the hospital how I analyze the blood picture alone. The blood picture is not all liver and kidney values and so on. The blood picture means the cells of the blood, the red and white blood cells and the blood cells. I have extremely rare patients who already have zero symptoms there. Even if it's a borderline anemia, if these strange letters that are always there, MCV, MCH, MCHC, I'm sorry, even many colleagues, at least the younger ones, often in the hospitals cannot interpret, or are simply ignored. Where I can usually read out deficiencies, like B12 or folic acid, then I can already see that something is going on. If I have a severe inflammation, the blood cells already change. We make the subgroups of the white blood cells. I have not rarely increased lymphocytes, which simply speaks for virus activity. These are the white blood cells that work against viruses. And I have a lot of statements with this extremely inexpensive measure, if I can interpret it. We do the homocysteine value regularly. The homocysteine value gives me information about B6, B12 folic acid deficiency. It is not one of the very best values you can do. But it is increased so often, I don't need an even more accurate, even more expensive examination, if I look at the blood sample at the same time. To simply determine a B12 value in the serum is so precise, I can even throw a coin. I have not yet experienced that the holotranscobalamin is supposedly a very good value. I have examined many people with a clear B12 deficiency, where the holotranscobalamin value was absolutely okay. And how do you diagnose the deficiency? As I just explained. With the blood sample with the homocysteine, this is something common, and it is not specifically for vegans or vegetarians. All people have that. I can almost always save myself the other examinations. And there are enzymes with other blood values that are quite common, which are extremely zinc dependent. I can already see people have zinc deficiency without having to do other examinations. So that is very expressive. There are metabolism values that can tell me a lot. There are values that can reflect the liver function, even without having to do a lot of research, which I have to do with Express in the laboratory. I'm not talking about the liver values. These are liver cell values. Give me a liver cell damage. So, dear people, if something is conspicuous, then the liver is really bad. If the kidney values are conspicuous, liver and kidney values become conspicuous when up to two-thirds of the organ functions are no longer in order. And just to say, hey, the values are inconspicuous, with liver and kidneys everything is fine, is a bit. I think so too. Clearly impaired people come from the doctor and say, my blood values are great. And if I listen carefully, if I ask, is there a noon low, is there afternoon low? I can tell by myself. When I'm well detoxified, I really have an inner clock, it goes off at 10 p.m. Then I'm in bed within five minutes. Now I have to go to bed. Then I know, cool, it works. I can find out a lot with proper anamnesis. I can also find out a lot with a physical examination. For example, I leave fingerprints on many of my patients when I examine them. Then I already know, they have a totally disturbed environment. These are secondary water deposits, maybe a little bit earlier people use the term slackening in the tissue. Maybe that's not quite professional, but it might give you an idea of what it is. It's usually protein deposits. And so you get an incredible amount of information where you have to say, okay, I might not have to do a crazy lab in the first blood test.
I have many patients where I say, we're going to do this and that now. I look at the lab results, then the fine-tuning of the therapy comes. And then I look, have they responded to the therapy so far or not? And then I still have the possibility that you go deeper into the lab analysis. What I really like to do is a VNS, i.e. the analysis of the vegetative nervous system. A cheap and inexpensive method to look at, where someone is standing with their involuntary nervous system. So parasympathetic and sympathetic. I don't see people who can't regulate with their parasympathetic and the sympathetic is high, but sometimes also turned around. That the parasympathetic has the upper hand and then someone doesn't get enough into the activity. I could talk to you for hours now. It's so nice what you're bringing up on the table. I think we'll just intensify the individual topics in further episodes. But if the viewer says, I want to take out more for myself now, I need more information. What are the possibilities? Of course, he can get in touch with us. We are in the beautiful Schwellbrunn in Switzerland. This is the Biomed Center Sonnenberg. We have various diagnostic possibilities, we have various therapeutic possibilities, and of course we have doctors. Great. And that's what it's all about. It's really about being able to read this blood picture. That's what it's all about, right? And then the realization, the individual. Exactly. Nice. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for being here. I look forward to welcoming you again soon. See you then. See you. Dear viewers, chronic fatigue. Some of you know that for sure. There is always a little tool in the hands of our guests to get out of this fatigue trap. Thank you for watching. I wish you a wonderful time and see you soon. Bye.